Good evening. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Kelly Wright. I'm glad you could be a part of us for this next hour as we focus on those matters that are most important to the African-American community. So certainly tonight we'll be talking about the COVID-19 impact on our community. We'll also be talking about the power of prayer because Thursday was National Day of Prayer. So we'll have our own form of that tonight. But in my opening observations, we'll talk about this. I received quite a bit of email and social mail based on the disdain that people have for the death of Ahmed Arbery. As you know, two white men in Brunswick, Georgia gunned down the unarmed black men. So let me read to you now some comments that people have sent to me via my social media pages. They state, this is quite a tragedy for this young man, his family, and does not speak well for the community of Brunswick, Georgia. How can two district attorneys recuse themselves from doing their job? This needs a lot of prayer and justice. Another comment, unbelievable. Our country needs to repent of this culture of death. And another says, so awful. These two should have been immediately arrested and charged with murder, praying for justice for this young man and his family. And finally, one person wrote, this insanity has to stop. God help us. Indeed, all of them are right to express their disdain for an act of violence that was so senseless and tragic. And those are my opening observations. So joining me now is my first guest is Dr. Benjamin Chavis. He is the president and CEO of NNPA, Black Press USA. And Doc, yesterday we were talking about the killings of two unarmed black men, one in Indianapolis, and that was Sean Reed. And then the, uh, the case in Brunswick, Georgia, the killing of Ahmad uh, Arbery. Uh, the young 25-year-old man who would have turned 26 today had he been able to uh, survive that attack on him by two white men, a father and son, uh, the father being a former member of law enforcement. They were arrested last night. The two men were both charged with murder and aggravated assault in Aubrey's killing, and that is Gregory, who is 64, and his son Travis, who is 34, Gregory and Travis McMichaels are now in prison, arrested by the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Yet we still have to find out what will happen when a grand jury convenes after we get through this COVID-19 pandemic. They're talking about that the grand jury will convene in June. And a lot of people, Doc, are looking on the sidelines saying, will justice be served? Well, thank you very much, uh, Kelly, and um, of course, we all across the world literally have been following the case in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, with the arrest last night of the two assailants by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Uh, at least people now see that there may be, there may be uh, some justice that will come out of this, but we've got to be vigilant. An arrest is not a conviction. An arrest is not uh, a prison sentence. Uh, they're incarcerated right now. They may make bail. Uh, I don't know if the judges have given them a preliminary hearing, but it is a positive step that they at least have been arrested. You know, the killing took place in February. Yes. Uh, we're now in May. So it took all this time. If it had not been for the courageous acts of the mother and the family uh, of, of our dear brother uh, and the lawyers, the black lawyers involved, uh, Lee Merritt and uh, Benjamin Crump and many others, uh, this thing would not have uh, happened. So that's why we have to stay vigilant. And I appreciate the fact that on your show, Kelly, that you focus on the case in Georgia. We also need to focus on the case in Indianapolis and all of these cases. I think that um, one of the things that we know, even before COVID-19, uh, there was uh, mass incarceration, uh, racial discrimination in the criminal justice system, racial discrimination in law enforcement, and of course, uh, the absence of Black Lives Mattering, Black Lives Having Worth uh, to the general uh, community. And I think that this is something that we're gonna continue to focus on. Uh, but at least last night with these arrests 
uh, I think we are beginning to keep the pressure on so that uh, there can be some modicum of justice uh, in the wake of these tragic shootings. We can't let that happen, Doc. We got to keep uh, sounding the alarm. I'd like you to stay with me because on the other side of the break, I want to I want to talk to you about something that slipped by us yesterday because we were rightly focused on this issue, but we can't forget the fact that it was National Day of Prayer, and we want to have Absolutely. an opportunity to talk about that here and your contributions to the National Council of Churches as well as America with a prayer that they asked you to provide. We want to come back on the, uh, the end of the break with Dr. Benjamin Chavis in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. So I'm talking to Dr. Benjamin Chavis, who is the president and CEO of the NNPA, the Black Press USA. Uh, Doc, I, I want people to know, I want to remind some folk, because some people just view you as being a newspaper man, and you're much more than that. You are really in the forefront and still in the civil rights uh, activist role because you started at the age of 14 marching along Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And then throughout your career uh, with the Wilmington situation, uh, one of America's political prisoners, and you had to fight for that. You still went to college. You still completed your university degree at Duke. Uh, while you were in prison, incarcerated, over politics and over racism, and I mean, I'm speaking it for you because I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression that you're just a newspaper man. You are someone who has put it on the line and you've never wavered from uh, your faith in helping America get stronger by talking to our sins and addressing our own individually and collectively. And then furthermore, you were the co-leader and co-founder of the Million Man March, and we will be celebrating that anniversary uh, in October. So uh, having said that, I wanna to talk to you about the National Day of Prayer, uh, which took place yesterday, and why prayer is so important in these turbulent times in which we find ourselves living in. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, uh, prayer is in the tradition of our people. Um, even before slavery, uh, African people prayed, and certainly African Americans prayed. And yesterday was a National Prayer Day. Uh, I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, and I was very pleased when my denomination asked me uh, to be one of the ones that offered prayers. The Reverend William Barber also prayed yesterday. And I just will give you the short take of what I said yesterday in the prayer uh, as the former also uh, national vice president of the National Council of Churches. Uh, I am a newspaper man, uh, but I'm, I'm a newspaper man in the context of being a freedom fighter. Uh, my whole life, uh, Kelly has been devoted to fighting for the rights of black people. But when you fight for the rights of black people, you fight for the rights of all people. So my prayer yesterday was a prayer for the oneness of humanity. Uh, amidst this COVID-19, amidst these uh, recent racially motivated killings of black people uh, in Georgia and Indiana and across America, actually, my prayer was that we begin to see each other as brothers and sisters, part of the human family. Uh, the oneness of God presupposes the oneness of humanity. God's creation is one. And of course, racism divides us. White supremacy divides us. Hatred divides us. Love has to overcome all of that. So my prayer was for the nation and for the world, for the oneness of humanity. That's a fantastic prayer. And that's certainly something we need to be cognizant of in this day and age where we're still grappling with the fact that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted communities of color. And yet we know that the coronavirus really knows no color. It just goes through everybody if we're not careful. And as we continue to reopen the states throughout America, we must be cognizant of the fact and aware of the fact that we have to do everything we can to protect each other, even with regard to ending racism and the inequities and the division and the strife and the violence that it has caused. <clears throat> so I salute you and the 
the United States of America were having enough sagacity to understand that we must go to prayer. That is the one thing that will, uh, I believe, help each and every one of us. And I appreciate you being able to share that with uh, so many people in the United States. And I did not want uh, the, the efforts to go unnoticed for all people who have stepped up to pray during the National Day of the Prayer, including the First Lady and so many other people uh, who represent the United States of America. Well, thank you very much. And God bless you. And uh, keep up the good work with the Kelly Wright Show. And may God bless the Black News Channel, as well as BlackPressUSA.com. Thank you. We will do our best. God bless you. Dr. Benjamin Chavis, right here on The Kelly Wright Show. We'll be back with much more after this. Welcome back to the program. So joining me now to weigh in on the issue of the uh, violence that we've seen inflicted upon uh, two African-American men, uh, Sean Reed in Indianapolis, and of course, Ahmed Arbery in um, Brunswick, Georgia, is Bobby Kipper. Now, Bobby is the founder of the National Center for Prevention of Community Violence. And he's also part of the Kipper Group. He's a retired Newport News, Virginia police officer. He served in law enforcement for 30 years. And he is also a Wall Street Journal best-selling author for various books, three books at least, that have outlined his concerns about the social justice issues that we have in America. Bobby, thank you for joining us uh, from your home in North Carolina now, right on the ocean. It is in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and I'm about, uh, about a block from the ocean, Kelly. It's always great to see you. Thanks for having me. Good to see you too, my friend. And uh, look, you're aware of these cases that have been out there. You've been aware of numerous cases that have been out there where it's caused a lot of uh, consternation, anxiety, and stress within the African-American community, the Latinx community, communities of color. So Bobby, uh, how do we address these racial uh, bias issues that keep confronting uh, law enforcement or members of law enforcement, because you're out there in the front lines, so to speak, actually teaching police right. chiefs and their police departments how to get beyond the racial bias. Uh, there are a couple points that I would make about this, Kelly, especially the recent um, you know, situation in Georgia, which is just so sad. Um, just totally a, a case of, of vigilante non-justice but just vigilantes who basically see a gentleman, uh, you know, thinking he's a burglar. We all understand that burglars don't run down the middle of the street, especially in, in jogging attire. So that's the first mistake. And the real concern that I have is the background. One of them was an investigator, a retired investigator, I think, from a district attorney's office and had police experience. That overly concerns me. Um, it, it almost mirrors the issue of, of the Trayvon Martin situation mm. uh, down in, in, you know, in Florida, down in Stanford, Florida years ago, where you had a person who was acting more or less as a security guard and trying to do what they thought was street justice, which nobody has a reason to do that. That's why we have organized law enforcement, and I'll get to that in a minute. But we, we have got to take a stand in America about, you know, the fact of it is, is that who gives people the right to accost people in the street based on this situation that happened in Georgia. I mean, you know, a gentleman's running down the street, he's a jogger. I mean, again, that's easy to see. And it really concerns me that a career police officer would even think that this is something other than it was, a man working out and running down the street. So I think there's just a real issue of judgment in that whole situation. And from what I gather from the situation, there, there's just no way that that's justification for number one, stopping a person. And number two, especially carrying out lethal force to an unarmed individual who's not done anything. Um, we have to be concerned in America when people feel like they can take that on their own to make those type of decisions. And again, let me go back and emphasize, not a person who was just a layman, a person who apparently had law enforcement training as an investigator and coming from the law enforcement realm of 30 years myself, um, that's bogus. That, that doesn't fit the bill for me. So that, that's the first problem. The second problem I'll mention is in policing. I, you know, I think we have to do a better job of you know, our selection process and our training process. I think you know, we do a lot of human rights training, uh, as you're well aware, in the police academy up in Virginia. Uh, we do a lot of you know, uh, 
ethnic communication background you know type training and de-escalation training of police officers uh, we've been doing that as you're well aware for quite some time because we feel like that um as you know in our center uh, it's violence is a process it's not an event and so what happens in many of these cases is those processes are escalated you know maybe sometimes not by the suspect but very once in a while um i have to say that the police could probably do a better job of working on the solution side of it so you know culture sets climate is the other thing we we have got to impress upon a police culture uh how important it is and human rights comes first uh and, and obviously judgment and discretion the, the problem that we have is police departments are having a hard time finding people to do the job number one um and we need to do a better job of treating our police officers within our organizations better job of training treating them well and I think all this comes to, to play when you're talking about the injustice that we're that we're seeing in different cities. Yeah, it's getting old, and we gotta we gotta find a, the way to get to. It. And I think you've said it very well. Uh, Bobby Kipper, founder and executive director of the National uh, Center for the Prevention of Community Violence. I appreciate you so much for coming on and such a candid and lively discussion about an important issue that. We've got to get to the bottom of and root all of this madness out. So, Bobby, come on the show anytime. You're always welcome, my friend. Thank you, Kelly. It's always great to see you, buddy. Yeah, oh, we yeah. Can each other uh, a lunch. Uh, we, we'll get through this. Okay. We will. We will, and we'll make sure. I'm gonna. Hey, yeah, I'm gonna take you up on that. Now it's been too long. We gotta lay. We gotta at least elbow each other. Okay. So, okay. All right. See well, you, Kelly. Thanks. thanks for having me, man. Take care. Right. Bless you. Back with more of the show after this. Welcome back. So my next guest is Dr. Carol Swain, and she is a conservative uh, member of the, the Republican Party, but she's also, first and foremost, a, a woman who's dedicated to education and helping people. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about uh, Dr. Swain, she is an American conservative, as I said, a television analyst, as well as a former professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Swain, good of you to join us today. And probably most importantly, I'm a Christian, a born again Christian, became a devout believer in 1999 after I had taught political science and earned my PhD and won lots of awards. Well, you had a lot of reason to scoff at uh, faith, and yet you've uh, just mentioned that you are a woman of faith. And that's kind of important because uh, just a few moments ago, I was talking to Dr. Benjamin Chavis about yesterday being the National Day of Prayer. And we had wanted to give extra focus to that because we believe that it's so important that the nation continues to uh, look to God in prayer in these turbulent times we find ourselves living in. What's your uh, take on the fact that the, the nation, uh, from the top of the administration all the way down to the people in the streets, have to resort to prayer and action? Well, I participated in a, a prayer uh, session yesterday. I prayed for the national government, and I try to pray for our government daily. So I think it's very important, and I believe that only God can change the conditions of this world, that there is no political solution for what ails America or what ails the world. And are you satisfied with what government leaders are telling us to do? Because it seems like their messaging is uh, at best um, trying to find uh, a needle in the haystack and giving us a silver lining that we can get back to a normal economy and that we can get through this. And yet you can't refute some of the scientific evidence that is out there, regardless of the debate. It depends. Uh, you know, I was a political scientist for, uh, I'm still a political scientist. I was a professor for 28 years, but I'm still a political scientist. And so I understand how research uh, is conducted. I understand how to lie with statistics. I understand that there are political agendas too that's driving a lot of what we see. And I am concerned about the heavy handedness in some cities and states, including my own city, that's taken place. And so, you know, we have government leaders, we have scientists, but you also have people with financial and political interests. 
And so um, I'm very concerned and I've always been a skeptic. I've written three articles involving some aspects of the coronavirus and um, I'm doing what I've always done. I, I speak what I believe is, is truth and I don't put my trust in any man-made solutions. And I think that we are human beings. We have our political uh, motivations and there's no such thing as objective science. Before I let you go, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I want people to understand your background because where you are today, it took you a while to get there because it didn't look like it was going to happen. I'd like you to share that story with us uh, again. Yes, and you know something, I would never have ever thought about becoming a political scientist or even have known that I would go to college because I was one of 12 children born and raised in rural poverty in Southwestern Virginia. My parents were not college educated. We all dropped out of school after the eighth grade. I married at 16, had my first child at 17. By the time I was 21, I had three small children. I went to a community college, got the first of five degrees and people came into my life they steered me uh, towards uh, academia. And I see this now as God's blessing because some poor kid from Southwestern Virginia, I knew nothing about tenure. I knew nothing about academia. I didn't have college educated people in my immediate family. It would never have happened without God. Hmm. Fantastic story, uh, Dr. Carol Swain. And it's uh, inspirational to each and every one of us. And on this program, we want to inform people we want to inform people from all sides of the issue, conservative, liberal, black, white, uh, Republican, Democrat, independent. But at the end of the day, we also want to inspire them. And certainly your story is one of inspiration. So thank you. Dr. Curtis. And what God does for one, he would do for all. And so he's no respecter of persons. And so my story can be your story. Fantastic way to end this. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. And we'll be back with more of the show after this. Welcome back to the program, everyone. So we're focusing right now on strengthening the family. The family must be stronger in tough times and helping us do that is George and Tondra Gregory uh, of Journey for Life, also chaplains to the NFL team, the Los Angeles Chargers. And they're living in lovely California. I ain't mad at them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't back that love them. I uh, got mad love for you guys as we talk about strengthening the family. Yeah, you know, both of you uh, uh, strike a, a real uh, harmonious chord in, in the fundamentals of why prayer is so important especially in this day and time where we're seeing so much happen racially. Uh, I mean, George, to your point, uh, there are a lot of uh, African-American men who are fathers and, and, and Tondra, a lot of African-American women who are mothers. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not thinking, how do I help protect my children sure. in, an, in, a, in an era where racial violence is still happening uh, you know, and, and so we, we do have to resort to prayer. God help them when they're out there. So, and help the person that may or may not confront them so that there's a, a meeting of the mind so that everyone walks away safe and sound. Sure. Now, compound that with coronavirus and compound that with just life's troubles in itself. Uh, the family can really be fractured and stressed out and, and so that's why I wanted to have you on to talk about why prayer is so good, because it kind of releases the valve of the stress, stress and brings us together, I think, in a, in a closer way. Yes, right. Yeah, we, we, you know, for us, you know, prayer is not something that you only go to in crisis, that's right? right. Mo a lot of people do that. Uh, but faith in action says you make it a regular part of your daily diet. You know, we, we, we talk about creating habits. It takes about seven times to create a habit. And yet prayer is one of those things that is just as important as brushing your teeth or uh, as important as locking your doors at night. Mm -hmm. um, we, we believe in the power of prayer. And so for us, uh, it, family should now make this a central part 
of what we do. We, we look at an acronym of PUSH, pray until something happens. I love what my <laughs> wife just said, you know, in Divinity School, we were, we were talking about some black and white issues. Uh, I went to Duke Divinity and it was, it was a, I forget what, it, what was happening, but we were getting ready to pray and someone, someone yelled out, it's time for action. Um, and, and so there was this discourse of, do we take action or do we pray? And then our, our, our divinity professor said, this is prayer as we talk about what to do, right? And so it's not just about what we do, it's about what we ask God to go along with us. Uh, I was reading a scripture yesterday to our front office staff or the chargers, where it says that, it says that God will be our strength. He will be our helper. He will be there to hear not only our prayers, but he will be there with us. And so we got to take him with us, not just mentally or emotionally, but we've got to take him here in our heart as well. Amen. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Even coming from uh, my profession is mental health. And I even say from mental health, just meditation and prayer, meditation for me and prayer are the same, right? But that helps us cultivate just a calmness so that we're not reactive to every moment as well, right? Because we have to slow down if we're going to think logically and plan strategically. Mm -hmm. we, we really need to keep ourselves very calm so that that part of our brain can be opened up for us to be able to be logic and strategic and we can't react to every moment. It has to be you know, that big picture. Uh, don't let one moment in time um, kind of hinder the big picture moment too, because we want to have lasting impact, right. not momentary impact. That's so fantastic what uh, both of you just said and prayer uh, spurs action, but action that's carried out with wisdom. And, and you can be righteously indignant with what goes on and you can speak to the injustice so that you get justice. But Boy, the power of prayer really helps that. Uh, before I go, let me break all the rules again because we like breaking rules here on the show. So I'm gonna ask you guys to give us a real quick prayer for the family, keeping it strong. Uh, so for all of those who watch the Kelly Wright Show on the Black News Channel, understand that we have you covered in prayer. So George, uh, lead us in a quick prayer real quick. Sure, I'm just gonna grab my wife's hand just to the power of just unity. And so Father, yes. uh, we pray God for, for families, Lord. Your word says that if my people which are called by my, by my name will humble yourselves and pray, and seek your face and turn from our ways, then you will heal from heaven and heal our land. And we need, we need an answer. We need an answer for injustice. We need an answer for COVID-19. And so before we come up with all of our solutions, we're gonna come to you and say, say Heal, heal our heart, heal our land. Lord, there's many things that we have on our minds today. We pray for your peace. We pray for your, your strength. We pray for your promise. We pray, God, for your promotion. We pray, God, for families. Make us stronger. Make us healthy. We pray for fathers, for mothers, for sons and daughters. In your name, amen. Amen. George and Tondra, thank you. That was wonderful. I think uh, the... Uh, LA Chargers might do really well this season. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank well, you. We, we hope so. Yes, we, we hope do so. Hope so. We hope so. Yeah. I remember someone once asked, Kelly, is this going to be a religious show? And I said, no, it's not a religious show, but we're not going to avoid talking about faith. Or we're not going to avoid talking about prayer. And we might even do it. And we just did it. So yes. I appreciate you so much. Keep on doing the good work out there and being the good news in a bad news world. George and Tondra Gregory, Gregory helping to strengthen the family making the family strong. And we will be back with more after this. Welcome back to the program. So I'm delighted to introduce to you and known by many, especially those living in the New York City area, Dr. Yolanda Raglan, she is the top uh, podiatrist in New York City, and she, uh, you created a program, Doc, called Fix Your Feet, and in today's economy, because of the COVID-19 plunging our economy, uh, not only are you fixing people's feet, but you have a great story about how you fix your business in this era where so many people are looking at their funds being depleted because of coronavirus. 
So to those out there still struggling, trying to make ends meet, trying to keep their businesses on track, what would you suggest to them? Should they follow the same patterns you're doing where they go to social media and, and start hiring people out and conduct their business online? Is this the new normal that we're seeing? Oh, this is absolutely going to be the new normal. Uh, it, there's, no, there's no way to avoid it. I knew it was coming. Like I said, this just opened the eyes to the masses. So the few of us that have been already doing things like this, it just, it, it, we, we knew that this is, was the way that it was gonna go. COVID, what the COVID crisis did was force people to look into different ways. My mother always says, used to say to me, well, when you ain't got mammy, use granny. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so like you said, you got to use those tools, those resources, and they're there and they're available. And especially, I, I find that a lot of these small businesses, um, especially living in New York City, um, well, I live in both places actually, but uh, in New York City with these small businesses, I find that um, sometimes I want to utilize these businesses and I can't even find them online. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, and, it, it, and there's no reason not to be able to find someone online. To, to get, to, you know, to, add, to have a business domain does not cost a lot of money. You, you can probably get a business domain for like 10 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to put up a website. I, I know many people are intimidated by it. But it's so easy now, and with, I call it the University of YouTube, I believe T Tiffany Haddish said it as well, but I said it before her, but she made it hot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you, know, you can learn everything, and now, while your, your business, if your business is shut down, this is the time to learn. Get on the phone, learn how to do these things, even when it just comes, even simple things, graphic design, um, branding yourself, figure out what your logo is going to be, figure out what your mantra is going to be. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, the hair salon uh, to the bodega on the shop. All of these small businesses need to start putting into action uh, websites, figuring out ways that the next time this happens, what are we going to do so that we can resolve this, this issue? I love it. I love it. I love it, Doc, because you are giving us a message of empowerment and empowerment is powered and fueled by hope, uh, which means that hope prevails. And certainly your business has done so, especially if you've got an address on Park Avenue. <laughs> in New York City. Uh, look, uh, you got to come back on the show because the next time you come back on, we'll get into more of, of what's behind your practice of fix your feet. But I thought for today, it would be very important to let people out there know who are struggling to see an example of how successful you have been uh, because of being able to be open-minded about the new technology and using that as a vital tool to expand, to grow, and to be bigger than, than uh, what you already are. So I appreciate you so much for sharing your insights. It's very insp inspirational and aspirational for those of us who are trying to get to that new level in this new normal. Dr. Yeah. Yolanda Raglan. Thank you so much, Kelly, for having me on here, and I hope to come back on again. All right, and you're there in New York City, so do me a favor, please stay safe, and when you come home to D.C., again, please stay safe since we're under stay-at-home orders as well. I yeah. uh, appreciate you so much, Doc. All and right, everyone, stay safe, happy, and well. All right, bye-bye. All, right, all right, we'll continue with the show right after this. Welcome back to the program. So I'm delighted to introduce to you my next guest. Uh, she is Caitlin Dixon. She is a staff member of the InterVarsity organization, and she specializes in a lot of hard work there at the University of San Francisco. And joining Caitlin is a student at the University of San Francisco, Monica C. Ladies, thank you for joining uh, me today on the program. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Steve, for having us. Well, as you know, we're in this COVID-19 global pandemic, and it has certainly impacted all of California. 
and San Francisco, and people have been told to stay home, stay indoors because of the potential spread of the coronavirus. Also, you're aware of the fact that it has adversely impacted communities of color. Uh, and, And having said that, how are you, Caitlin, able to help students like Monica and other students throughout the University of San Francisco, regardless of the color of their skin, but how do you help them maneuver and handle uh, the COVID-19 disruption, if you will? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think right now during my time on staff, um, I've been focusing a lot on uh, people's spiritual and emotional uh, development and needs right now. I think more than ever students, um, yeah, really need to know that there's hope during this season, that there's hope in God. Um, And that's not like naivete or um, optimism, but more like, hey, there's hope in God and he sees the struggles that we're going through and that he's with you in them. And it's not like um, not being naive or not, yeah, not looking at the realities, but really being rooted in like, this is our reality and this is happening. We're sheltering in place, but God is there with you, with your family in your home. So so you're keeping them grounded spiritually so they can deal with things in the reality of the natural. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's an important component to have, especially uh, an organization like InterVarsity, which looks at the, uh, not only the, 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 the mental aspects of education and the physical aspects of education, but the spiritual aspects as well. And Monica, you're a student there at the University of San Francisco, and I, I liken univers- the InterVarsity program to the whole person concept, where you're being taken care of mind, body, and spirit. Has it helped you as a student as you're undergoing this this crisis and these unprecedented times of the coronavirus? Yes, I would say definitely InterVarsity as a community has helped me. I think in the beginning, I very much isolated myself and was just taking all the emotions in with shelter in place and, you know, being at home all the time and having to balance schoolwork along with my relationship with God, as well as my relationship with my family members. And so I actually like broke out of my shell because of InterVarsity. I think as a leader, it really encouraged me to not be so selfish and dwell in my own feelings, but realize that we're all in this together, even though we're at our own homes isolated, but we are going through the same emotions, um, even though they are unique to us. And Yeah, just going to weekly meetings with InterVarsity, seeing different faces, seeing Caitlin's face regularly is really nice. And I think without that, it would be really hard to get through this time. Uh, You know, Caitlin, I find it refreshing that students like Monica would talk about not only their their education and their families, but their relationship to God. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because certainly at a time like now, faith is... It's something we need to exercise over fear. Uh, and, and Caitlin, so how do you continue to help students see that faith is, is something that we can use as a weapon against the, uh, the coronavirus and, and, and knowledge as well to protect ourselves from coronavirus? Yeah, I think my main job on staff, uh, regardless of the coronavirus, but especially because of the coronavirus, um, is just to create a space for students uh, to interact with God um, and a space for them to convene with him um, and to receive his peace and his power and his wisdom. I think some really cool things that we're doing this semester um, since transferring online is that we actually started this art Bible study where we are going through the Psalms and uh, King David was so emotional um, and a lot like a lot of us during this time and the Psalms really bring up all these emotions that I think sometimes um, we try to intellectualize or rationalize away during this time as we're trying to um, just survive and cope. But through this art Bible study, we've actually been able to uh, get to the deeper emotions and express them uh, through creative expression. So we've done poems, drawings, paintings, um, and that has been a really wonderful space to just um, have students open up and share about what they're going through and also know that like God is on their side and God is on their, like in their corner for them. Well, Monica C., Caitlin uh, Dixon, it's a pleasure to have you both on the program and to talk about your faith. 
you know, I, on this program, we're, we're not ashamed to have faith discussed. It is part of, uh, in fact, it's probably one of the most underreported uh, important aspects of life globally. And we just don't report on it enough, whether it's uh, Christianity and some of the other faiths as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that you're able to come on and share that. And uh, I think it can be of help to other students your age and Caitlin, the work that you're doing through InterVarsity. And the work of InterVarsity for years has yeah. been uh, very, very instructive and inspirational and informative to so many students throughout the world. So thank you both for being on the program. You're always welcome back. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Thank right. you so much. God bless you. Stay safe, all right? Yes, he will. God bless you. San Francisco. Too. I got to come visit you when we get, get a chance to do that. God bless yeah. you. are watching The Kelly Wright Show. We'll be back with more after this. Welcome back to the program. And now for my final word. As you know, Sunday is Mother's Day. So I want to take time out right now to thank all of the women who are mothers for the hard work you do in helping to raise productive children. It's not easy. And I would be remiss if I did not thank my wife, Loretta Lynn Wright, being the mother of my children and doing such a great work. And finally, before I leave you, there's my own mother, June Lorraine Overton Wright, a woman who poured out her life to me, literally. At the age of 16, she was raped by a pastor. She had the option of having an abortion, but she chose to keep me. And at the age of 17, she became a single parent and continued on pouring her life into me and providing me with the things that I am doing today. And that's the knowledge and the understanding that love prevails against all odds. So thank you, June Lorraine Overton Wright, even though you're no longer here on this earth with me, I know you're in heaven, smiling down. And thank you for sharing in my life, love, freedom, and peace. Hopefully you've been righted, ignited, and united to tell all moms around the world, let's keep on loving each other because love prevails. Have a good weekend, everybody. God bless. What's your thing? Love, freedom, and peace. All right. Well, I'm free. To learn above. To give us all just a little more love. Wash all the hate.